With pleasure, I introduce the moderator of our Student Voices session, our own Jamel Sin Mims from Skuzakan, New York City. Thank you, Jamel, for leading us, uh, leading, uh, us uh, uh, today. No problem. How's everybody doing out there? Let's show some love in the chat. All right. Now, look, we all know that COVID-19 has transformed the landscape of education over, overnight. Am I right? And the way that teachers teach and the way that students learn has completely been transformed. We're living in a world of smartphones and social media where the gap between real life and online is narrowing. What does it actually mean to be living life as a young person in the digital age right now? This is a question that workforce leaders, educators, and students around the country have actually been asking in the midst of this crisis, which has radically altered work and education as we've come to know them. Inequities have been exposed and deepened. Communities have rallied. Possibilities are growing. And in this session, we're gonna hear directly from two high school students from the epicenter of a global pandemic here in New York City. How is equity being addressed in this moment? And what opportunities do technology afford us to see how the other half lives? How is this a time to throw out the rule book and a time for young people to pursue their ambitions and be given the tools that they need to actually transform the world? Let's explore what it means to connect work and education in an age where now more than ever, these two things have to work together. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speakers. Let's give it up for Brandon from Edward R. Murrow High School and Emmy from Urban Academy, both who are part of the policy team at Teens Take Charge. Hi guys, um, thank you for that amazing opening and introduction. Um, as said before, my name is Brandon St. Louis. Uh, I'm a junior at Edward Armour High School. I'm 16 years old and I'm a member of the policy team at Teen State Charge. Technology sets the pace for almost everything else in the world. The medicine we take, our means of communication, the way we work and what we read, though it doesn't connect to anything as much as it does the way we teach our youth. Throughout the centuries, technology and education have coexisted in a continuous race and competition between each other. Both have played a part in advancing each other. Of course, there are some points in history where technology speeds ahead and education is forced to try to keep up the pace. A prime example of this occurred in 1440, when Johannes Gutenberg became, began experimenting with the process in which books were produced while in exile from Germany. After almost 10 years of research, models, and determination, he finally had his printing machine perfected and ready to use commercially. This creation was the beginning of what is now known as the printing revolution, allowing the general public to have access to cheaper books and allowing knowledge to no longer only be accessible by the wealthy. But there was still one problem. Unfortunately, only a small fraction of the population actually knew how to read. Since it was so rare to even own a book, being able to read one was obsolete, meaning there was no reason to be literate. Education created and continued a gap of inequality between socioeconomic classes. Of course, now over 84% of the world's population can read. And that number jumps to 99% if you just focus on Germany's literacy rate where the first Gutenberg printing presses were made. But what allowed this change to occur? Well, at some point between 1450 and 1550, the average reading rate in Germany more than doubled from a mere 7% to 16%. Over the next century, the number of literate adults doubled in Germany and remained at this level until the early 19th century when it continued to grow to what it is today. These stats, though specific to Germany, are not very different for most places in the Western world. In 1870, the population of the United States was, that was older than 14% of age was 80% literate. By 1900, that changed to 89%, which changed to 97% in 1952 before reaching a plateau at 99% now. Our educational system was revolutionized to allow this change to happen. As schools and universities became more and more popular, and soon, as literacy rates became more and more important to getting a job, public education became popular and a paradigm shift was set in motion. Similar processes to this have happened multiple times throughout history. New technological advancements are created, racing ahead of our educational system at the time, leading to social pain and gaping inequalities until eventually our whole educational system is flipped, creating a paradigm shift that helps to equal out the playing field. Of course, 
Inequalities are still rampant, but less gaping to the public eye than. Techno technology sets precedence for the needed skills of the future, and it is the job of our educational system to notice and follow these precedents. So let's fast forward into the 21st century as we are currently going through another technological shift. With the invention of digitalization and the internet, technology has yet again gone miles ahead of what students in our public schools are being prepared for. We have entered a time where getting an entry level position requires an applicant to have access to a working computer, know how to use it, if they even want to apply. We have made the choice to become a tech-based society fueled by Silicon Valley, yet we are leaving millions of young people behind by failing, them to, by failing to teach them how to operate successfully in this new society. In the next 10 years, up to one third of work activities could be completely replaced by computers, yet the population of the United States will almost reach 350 million people meaning even more young people will be, will be receiving a public education. And who are the young people we are failing to teach? The students receiving this public education. And that doesn't even begin to show the differences amongst public schools, depending on neighborhood and, and place. Today, the algorithms built by a few techies control the way we live our lives. They decide how we communicate with each other. They decide how we pay for things. And they can even be used to manipulate political elections. Yet the majority of students are not taught how this works. They are being left behind in the digital age. Our schools are perpetuating the wealth gap and stopping generational wealth from being created in lower class neighborhoods by not giving future generations the tools to succeed. There's an increasing gap between those who design the change and those who are left to survive in its wake. And this pandemic has allowed seeing these effects to become even clearer. The library card is no longer the, small, the, the only small wireless device that gives users access to thousands of books and movies. It is being replaced by smartphones and the internet. However, the only difference is that the internet is not free or accessible to everyone. There are currently private schools around the country teaching their students about coding, internet literacy, and everything else they need to succeed in this new world, making sure the elite and upper class stay in power. These changes are happening fast, but public education is always the last to adapt. We are in a new printing press paradigm, and we cannot wait over 200 years to teach the majority how to survive. Thank you. So hello everyone, my name is Emmy. Um, I am a senior at Urban Academy, getting ready to go to college in the fall. Finishing senior year and making my college decision at home has been challenging. However, I'm lucky to go to a small progressive high school. Urban has been very understanding of the extenuating circumstances affecting my school experience during this global pandemic. And the school focuses its resources on social, emo social emotional support during this time helping students to stay healthy and engaged. A week before quarantine began, I joined an organizing group called Teens Take Charge, also known as TTC. We are part of a larger movement for fighting, fighting for school integration. I am part of the TTC policy team, and we are building a coalition with like-minded organizations interested in educational reform, currently focusing on a campaign to eliminate the DOE high school admissions screening process. What I have seen during this time is the laying bare of raw inequality. I am privileged because I have a laptop, Wi-Fi, and a supportive mother who has a job she can do from home. I am privileged because I go to a school that meets my personal needs. I am also very connected to inequity. My father must go to work on 42nd Street every day because he has not been promoted in 20 years of working for UNICEF. He is a hardworking, smart man who cannot get ahead because he is a black, formerly incarcerated man in a racist world. I have friends who cannot keep up with schoolwork and possibly won't graduate because they don't have the support systems at home to cope with the struggles of remote learning. I have also seen my parents, my friends' parents get laid off because our economy has collapsed. Through my work for TTC, I have seen that thousands of kids have still not received the materials they need to learn from home. This crisis means these things. We have the opportunity to rebuild our education system. This could include making necessary updates to our grading system, finding a way to measure intelligence and academic performance differently. We need to legitimize alternative paths to the workforce through vocational schools, specifically capitalizing on the ways that technology is taking root in all aspects of our lives. Finally, we can find ways for the government to invest its resources in the education of marginalized communities. 
I am from Brooklyn, but I started commuting to the Upper East Side for school in the fifth grade, just so that I could be in District 2 for middle school and get priority for District 2 high school admissions. For as long as I can remember, I have been driven to get perfect grades so that I can get accepted by the most prestigious schools. But ultimately, I realized that I was fighting to compete in a universe that did not recognize my true strengths, but those that I could manipulate by knowing and working the system. During my sophomore year of high school, I went from getting straight A's to failing most of my classes. This was largely due to the fact that I was attending a predominantly white school that was riddled with racism. I saw it in my curriculum, I was discriminated against by faculty, I experienced microaggressions on a daily basis, and I witnessed racial bullying of the few black kids in my grade. When I called out my friend on social media for using the N-word, I was attacked with hundreds of racist comments from my classmates. They defended my friend as if I were threatening and dangerous. At my previous school, my chemistry grades suffered greatly because I was not the best test taker, despite the fact that I got all A's on my classwork and homework. My global teacher also brought my grade down to an F for being five minutes late to class a few times, while my white friend's grade was unaffected by her 30 minute daily latenesses. I was not, it was not until I started at my current school, Urban Academy, that I realized that my experiences were valid and shared by many of my peers in New York City. Urban Academy is a transfer school that serves as a safe haven for intelligent students that could not thrive in the traditional prestigious school environment. For students like me, it feels like a breath of fresh air to no longer be alienated as critical thinkers who question authority at school. At Urban, our academic performance is evaluated through self-directed projects across all academic disciplines and we have the freedom to choose what personal interests we want to explore with these projects. We are not being taught how to take a standardized test. We are pursuing our passions. We are learning by engaging with our communities. We are studying and sharing about our own identities and heritage. Our school uses a by any means necessary approach to learning, which really just means supporting each kid to learn in the best ways that they can. Urban also serves as an alternative school for students that were expelled from their previous schools. I've seen my peers end up selling drugs to survive after graduating from alternative schools or GED programs in my neighborhood. Whereas at Urban, I go to school with students who have been redirected to a path towards higher education. When your parents can buy your way into college, either directly or with money spent on test prep, tutors, etc., we are not employing real talent in schools. This excludes swaths of our society from opportunities while concurrently compromising the diversity and talent available to the professional world. What academic performance numbers show is that low income, primarily black and brown students are not smart and cannot succeed in our capitalist society. Obviously, this is false. It looks this way on paper because low income schools often do more poorly on standardized tests because of lack of resources and connections, as well as their family's inability to pay for test prep. Wealthy people have the privilege of buying their way into a career and thus buying a professional network. Private expensive colleges allow these students to explore their interests freely while learning the skills they need to succeed in the professional world. Beyond supporting better education for marginalized communities, how do we also provide alternative pathways to professional success? To give trade school students equal opportunity to succeed in the professional world, shouldn't we legitimize vocational training? To legitimize these alternative pathways, can we restructure trade schools? Once these schools can adapt to a more progressive way of learning, students will be able to explore their interests and pursue work that they are passionate about while learning a valuable trade. The digital transformation of our society opens up many new avenues for professionalizing vocational job paths. For example, the IT certificate program that my father used to get a consultant position at UNICEF, but left him without the skills he needed to get promoted. Other than the adoption of a progressive learning style, how do we ensure that vocational schools teach tertiary, uh, sorry, how do we ensure that vocational schools teach tertiary skills such as writing skills? Adequate resources. How do we allocate these resources? Should the government be responsible for funding schools to educate students who follow alternative paths? These students may not test well or get good grades, but demonstrate intelligence and drive in other ways.
Why is the government responsible for this funding? We can't rely on the generosity of predominantly white institutions with large endowments to choose who is worthy of a scholarship based upon performance indicators dictated by a hegemonic society. How do we protect these students from getting ripped off by large corporations that market trade schools towards people looking for a pathway out of poverty? We legitimize vocational schools and programs so students from marginalized communities have equal opportunity to innovate and lead our economy during a transformative era. This includes supporting youth to capitalize off of the universe of technology through social, social media development and marketing, software engineering, etc. We have the space and a tangible, clear reason to change our education system. Are we going to use this opportunity to rebuild from the roots of a broken education system or skate by and wait for the lack of truly diverse talent in our country to leave us lagging in a global market where diversified talent is a key to survival? Thank you.